good morning, GBC. Welcome, church, to our GBC Sunday service. And to those of you online, a very warm welcome to you also. Now, all of you look a little bit tense, huh? How about we look at the person next to you and give a wave or a thumbs up? Your biggest eye smile. Yeah, that's more like it. Are you all ready to worship God? Yes, give God an amen. amen. Come, let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you. Lord, it is truly a pleasure to be here as one body, to worship you, to honour you, to lift up your name. Oh Lord, I just pray that we come with clean hands, a pure heart to worship you. Thank you, Lord, that we can come with confidence to this throne of grace. Because Lord, you are merciful, compassionate, slow to anger and always willing to accept us the way we are so lord i just pray that lord as we come here we will give you our heartiest worship wholeheartedly lord let us be like david to be able to say praise his name my soul all my inmost being praise his holy name in jesus name i pray amen, amen. over to you worship team morning church shall we rise your hands together. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. can keep us apart so remember your people remember your children remember your promise so
the one who is great and strong. Come on, keep, keep. Come on, I think he deserves it. To see everyone back in, in the house of the Lord. He deserves the highest praise. Come on. Don't just lavish on him on your cross. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. To our good shepherd, our mighty God. He's faithful. He's highly evident in keeping every promise to his people. Amen. For yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O oh God, and you are exalted and above all, both riches and honor comes from you, Lord, and you rule over all, Lord. In your hand are power and might. And Lord, to see today, Lord, to see that the recovery is coming back strong, God. We want to give you praise, oh God, Lord, and give you thanks. Lord, we thank you, God, our God, and we praise your glorious name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Let's sing this again, our oh God. Let's sing this again, just with your voice. Truly, He deserves our highest praise. To see those that I have not seen for some time, and it was such, such a great joy to see everybody coming back to the house of the Lord. He deserves the highest praise, isn't it? Just one voice, one voice, and one heart. Let's lift it up. Our God is greater. Declare it out. Here we go. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any mother. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, sing our God, your great. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. Time of need. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. You have preserved us, Lord. Ooh, thank you, thank you, you Jesus. Jehovah Jireh. You are the God who is more than enough for each and every one of us, Lord. Our Jehovah Nisi. Lord, we worship you not only for what you've done in our lives, not only for the things that you have brought us out, not only for how many times you have blessed us, not only for the miracles you have done for us and through us, Lord. Thank you, thank you. Not only for the doors you have opened for us, the battles you have won for us, Lord. But Lord, we just want to come and to say, to worship you for who you are. Jehovah Jireh, my
worship you, God. We worship you, Lord. Bowing at the throne of grace. Bow before you, God. cross of grace how great the love how strong the hand that holds us beautiful so beautiful so here I bow to live you high Jesus, be glorified in all, all things for all my life. I am yours forever, yours. Where would I run? To the throne of mercy, where would I kneel? But at this cross of grace, how great the love, the strong the hands that holds us, beautiful, so beautiful.
of voices rising up and I, I know God is pleased right, right there the praises will reach up to His throne above will we'll really undo His nostrils it will be such a delight Father we, we are here to delight You we are here to please You we are here to worship You worship is all about us connecting with You it's always about You Father it's never about anyone let us not for a moment focus on issues that are not important but focus on You and You alone whatever that we do Father we don't want to do church we don't want to play church we just want to have a relationship with you Father let GBC be a church that is known to have such a relationship with you above all things else not even the good works but first and foremost a good relationship with you it is a church that is so connected to the heart of God to the very centre of what you are doing to your very purpose and your mission for our lives and then Lord in all these things then Lord you will look at us and say good and faithful church good and faithful GBC Father we want to please you in all things help us Lord if there's anything else in us that is stopping us from reaching that Lord in the intimate amazing relationship you know I'm, I'm just reminded again that our relationship you know Lord is saying to us really that kind of dynamic living relationship and in the intimacy that we can call on Him at this point and when we need help at any point, we call on Him and He will hear us. Father, Father, we want to bless your heart. We want to bless you. Father, not always coming to you and seek your blessing. But Lord, we want to turn this around. We have reached, want to reach a maturity. The time has come, Lord. We want to bless you. We want to bless you, Lord, and take delight in what we have offered. And Lord, when you look at the people, your people right here, you, you are so pleased. Father, and, and Lord, when the Father smiles unto us, that's all we ever need. That's all we ever ask for. To know, to see your smile upon us. Father, upon the people, upon the people that do not deserve it, but Lord, yet you have chosen us. What a privilege. What a joy. Thank you, Lord. And all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. You know, before we come to the communion table and partake of the elements, I just want to share a thought uh, with you. And somehow this thought, this passage I've selected, is connected to the worship. I, I really didn't know what song they wanted to sing. And uh, we don't coordinate in that sense. You know, these are the last words of Joshua. I'm sure you would know, if you have been reading your Bible, that the last words of the characters of the Bible are very profound. They are always very profound. And these are the words of uh, Joshua. 
His last words and he said this, recorded for us in Joshua chapter 24, reading from verse 14. Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your forefathers that worshipped beyond the river and e Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But, but, the but, everything else before that has been thrown out. But, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You know, I, I really, this is my desire that really every one of us at church, this is our cry. At the end of the day, in all things that we do, you know, at the end of the day, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And I believe that even as we are into this very unusual season, well, I really hope that the recovery will be permanent. We are on the trajectory to normalcy. I really hope so. Um, I, I have a lot of confidence, but I'm not sure. And I, I, I trust that at the end of the day, you know, if this is the trajectory, God is giving us a window period. A window period that is such a sense of urgency. I, I sense it in my spirit, such a sense of urgency for us to rise up, take our place of authority and work and bring light into places that are still dark in the lives of many people today. And, you know, I'm reminded again that, you know, that the Lord says that uh, in verse 11, Ecclesiastes, uh, in the Bible it says here, He has made everything beautiful in His time. He has set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. You know, God eventually will work out, make everything beautiful in His time. And I personally know many of you are, some of you, are struggling with few things, issues, relationships, family, finances, and all that. And I personally know that. I, I want to say to you at the end of the day, you know, this is a hope that we have in Jesus, that He will make everything beautiful in His time. And um, I want us to be reminded again, when we partake of the elements, the communion, we are partaking unto the death of Jesus, that we may be raised again on the day and we will, there will be no permanent second death for us. But more importantly, more importantly, we are partaking unto His victory, His blessing. Not that everything will be all right immediately, but Jesus will walk through that journey with us. While we are in that period of darkness in the valley, Jesus will walk through that period with us. And partaking of the Holy Communion together, it is partaking and do His work on the cross that we may appropriate everything else from, from the cross, from Calvary, the blood of Jesus into our lives that we may begin to know that in Jesus there is real hope. I want us to understand this as we partake of the elements together. Can we all rise? Let's all rise. On the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, He took bread and after He has given thanks, He broke it and says that this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, He took the cup and says this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Drink it in remembrance of me. Let me pray. Father, we want to thank You again that we were hopeless, completely hopeless and helpless. But Lord, in your grace and in your mercy, you sent Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your obedience. And we know we will never fully understand what you have to go through. That indeed, that we may pass over all those things, not be condemned internally for our sins. Father, when we look at the cross and what you have done for us, Many of the things in our life, the, the arguments, disagreements are so trivial. Lord, let us not grieve you, Lord, with the trivial things in life. 
because those things are so trivial in the light of what you have to go through, in the light of the heaviness of sin that you have conquered, you have done it all. Father, this is a call as we partake of this communion. Let us all know in our heart and spirit we partake unto the unity of the cross of the body of Christ. We partake unto goodness and we will not allow any thoughts of the kingdom of darkness to affect us. It cannot be, it will not do because Lord, you went to the cross for reasons like this that we all can enter into the life, life eternal, into the hope, hope eternal, into the glory, glory eternal. That's what you have called us to be. Father, we ask that we will not partake of this lightly, that none of us will be cursed as a result of partaking unto this and not knowing the consequences of what it means to be a part of the death of Jesus on the cross. Thank you, Lord. In all these things, Lord Jesus, we will never be able to pay, repay even the slightest iota, a dot of what you have done. We just receive by grace. We just receive it, Lord, because it's for us. It's priceless. It's free. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let's partake of the elements together. You may be seated. Pass this time to Zhou Ching for the GBC News. Hi, good morning again. And a very warm welcome to our GBC Sunday service. Hi to all of you in Level 3 and to those in Level 4 and those online. If you're joining us here for the very first time, can I welcome you to stand, or no, maybe don't stand, <laughs> just wave so that we can acknowledge you. Any? Anyone here for the first time? Yes. Yeah, the visitor. One more right at the back, yeah. You get a visitor card, please fill it up and pass to the ushers as you walk out after the service. And those for, you, for those of you online, please give us your details too so that we can connect with you. Okay? Just to take note that you still need to keep your mask on so that we can keep our church community safe. Okay? Well, I'm Jo Ching and yes, a very good morning to you. I'm here to bring you GPC News. Okay, next Sunday, on May 8, uh, the BM congregation will be celebrating Parayaan Gawai Keamatan. Okay, you'll be at 6 p.m. in the 14, the old church building. And um, do invite your BM speaking friends, colleagues, workers, helpers to join us in this Shukor service. Um, Pastor Eddie Marson will be speaking during this service. Um, the for the next item, Christian Education Series, um, the eight-part series on interpreting the Bible will continue by Dr. Vincent Ui. Part two, which is on May 8, Interpreting the Gospels, will be coming out this Saturday, coming Saturday. I encourage all of you to sign up. Dr. Vincent Ui is a good speaker, and he does bring lots of clarity and good understanding to the Gospels. Right. Um, the details to sign up will be available in our GBC broadcast WhatsApp chat. Um, this Wednesday, we'll be meeting online again corporately for our corporate prayer meeting. It's at 8.30 p.m. via Zoom. Do come and join us. And then, um, tithes and offering. Yeah, we encourage you to do online transfer to our Maybank account or make your cash check payable to uh, GBC, um, Joshua Baptist Church, Penang. There's a box right in front of the sanctuary that you can drop it off right after the service. Yeah, to get more information about our church, do follow us on social media, right? We are available on Facebook, Instagram, and of course, our website. You can find out more details about how you can get yourself involved. Okay, that's all from me. Let me pass this time to Brother Mock will bring us today's message. Thank you.
Good morning. Well, SOPs are changing, but I'm sure, especially our sisters here, will still be glad that uh, they are sitting one seat apart because that means that you have a seat for your handbag, right? <laughs> That's not what the message is about. <laughs> Come, let's pray. Our good and gracious King, we come now, Lord, to pay attention to your word. Father, we pray, Lord, that you will teach us knowledge, good judgment, Lord, that you will touch our very soul, O God, so that all these may result in our worship of you, in our obedience and transformed lives that will please you and that you will be proud of us. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray. Amen. Let me ask a, a question, a serious question. What would, what, do you have any plans? What would you do for the next one year for your life? I mean, for your life. In the next one year, have you considered what you would do? Or in the next three to five years, this is what you would do, this is how you would do it, because life is important, right? But on the other hand, why you want to do what you do, why you want to do all these things is equally important because the why motivates and steers and energizes the what and the how, correct? So in 1 Peter 4, as we continue on the series, Peter tells us in actually big and small ways today, 1 Peter 4, what and how of living a life that will please God. The what, the how, and we will look at five principles, five instructions that he gives. But before we do that, we must remember the why. The why that leads to what we should do. And the why is provided in the previous chapter, chapter 3, verses 18 to 20, uh, 22, towards the end of the chapter. And Peter underlined three truths. Why? Before he goes to the therefore of chapter 4. So in, at the end of chapter 3, he says these three truths. Christ has suffered once for sins to save you, to bring you to God. That's number one. Number two, Christ has died, but he is raised, he's resurrected, and this saves you. Why does this save you? Because we can look to our own resurrection, our own final welcome into the presence of God. And third, Peter says that Christ reigns supremely now. He reigns supreme. And all principalities, all authority, all powers are subject and submitted to Him. These are so important. Therefore, he goes to chapter 4. So before we go to chapter 4, we must remember that, you know, everything that undergirds chapter 4 is at the end of chapter 3. That Christ has suffered once for sins to save us. That He has resurrected and his resurrection will also save us. And he reigns supremely. The scepter is in his hands. Nothing, nothing is over him. He is over all. He is the only authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, chapter 4 begins. Therefore. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. So, Peter's instruction. Therefore, first, arm yourselves with the same attitude as Christ. That means be willing to suffer. Be willing to suffer. Not ready to surrender, not ready to call it quits, not ready to just strut, but be willing to suffer. Let your attitude be the same. Arm yourselves with the same attitude as Christ. Be willing to suffer. And a believer, us all Christians, should have the same resolve, the resolve like Christ, willing to be through and done with sin, choosing obedience even if it means suffering. Right? Let me say that again. The same attitude as Christ is to be willing to be done or to be through with sin, 
by choosing obedience even if it means suffering. It doesn't mean that Christ sinned, okay? But he dealt with sin. And in the same way, we must choose obedience and even be willing to suffer, to be done and true with sin. You know, Christ in Isaiah chapter 50, 6 to 7, the prophet Isaiah prophesied about this Messiah and he was pointing to Christ. And he said, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. Jesus knew that he was going to face all this, and yet it says here he set his face like flint. He was resolute, determined to go through and to choose obedience. Not my will, but yours be done. So he will not shrink back from his mission despite severe opposition, severe suffering and humiliation. He was unwavering in his determination to persevere. You know, I guess so many who could have said, I'm, I'm done. I'm done with suffering. I'm done with all this hardship. I guess so many who could have said that. I guess so many who could have said, you know, all, called on his angels to defend him from arrest. He could have done it, but he didn't. Obedience to God may lead to unpleasant suffering, unpleasant consequences. Maybe in your own witness, in your own task, in your own life as a Christian, you suffer the same kind of ridicule or rejection as we heard before. But here is Peter's instruction. Arm yourselves with the same attitude as Christ, with the same kind of resoluteness as Christ, choosing obedience even though it means suffering. Christ, who suffered for us, is worth suffering for. And that's the first thing that we need to remember. Arm yourselves with the same attitude as Christ. Let's go on to the next passage. As a result, for those who have so armed themselves, as a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for human desires, for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The second instruction that Peter tells these first century Christians is to focus on God's will and judgment. Focus on God's will and judgment. Really, there are two ways for us to live, and you can only choose one. According to God's will and counsel and his assessment, his evaluation of you, or that is his judgment, right? According to God's will and his judgment, or according to human will, human desires, and human, the world's judgment. There are only two ways to live. You choose one. And Peter tells us to choose the first one. Choose the first one, why? Because man can only judge the living. Here and now, you might face, people might pass judgment on you, on your faith, on how you live your life. But that's only now. But God, God will judge the living and the dead. And His judgment is the ultimate judgment. Who gets to call something good or evil? Only God. And God's judgment is the ultimate measure of a man. So, yes, in this world, at this time, people may judge you, pass, you know, nasty comments on you because of your faith, because of your Christianity, because of how you live, because of the values of Christian, or as a Christian. 
But God has the last say. So live, focus on God's will, on God's judgment, and not on human desires and the world's judgment. And there was a man, and we all know this man, actually. There was a man who was specially appointed by God, who had special power. He was, he was called from when he was very young, not even when he was very, even before he was born. And yet, he despised his calling and wasted his life. His name? Samson. Samson wasted his life. He was special. Of all the judges, of all the judges in the book of Judges, he was the only one who was specially appointed even before he was born. And yet, he was the only one who died with the enemy, the only judge. Such a sad life. Why? Because he gave in to his own desires, his own human will, rather than God. Samson did not focus on God, he focused on himself. He didn't serve God, he served himself. So are you concerned today about what other people think of you? Are you concerned about what they think of your Christian values? You know, people can pass nasty comments, okay, or, or you know, waylay you, or waylay, you can be waylaid. Take the example of marriage. They can say, hey, you know, you're not happy with your, with your marriage? Not happy? Why live in misery? A hey, divorce, lah. It's an easy way out. Choose another one. So many, the ocean is full of fishes, right? Choose another one. Lah. Why, why struggle through your marriage? Why so stupid? Oh, they can say things like that. Lah. And they can pass judgment like that. And the world also tells us, hey, you know, there are so many gadgets and, and new things. Hey, go and get them, you know. It, you, you are supposed to be happy, right? Live life to the full. Come on, you know, upgrade your, your, your old phone, you know, upgrade your car, upgrade your house. Why do you want to give so much to the church for? Your time, your money, your effort. Upgrade your life. Don't be so silly giving your time and your money and your resources to your religion. They can say that too. What are you concerned about? Are you concerned about how the world passes judgment on you? Or are you concerned and focusing on God's will and God's own judgment? So let us not embrace the gods of this culture. Focus instead on God's will and His standard or His judgment. Really, Proverbs 29, 25 says, Fear of man will prove to be a snare. The fear of man will prove to be a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Focus on God's will. Focus on God's judgment, not what the world says. Next, Peter says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. The third instruction from Peter for us is pray for God's agenda with urgency and fervency. Why does Peter say the end of all things is near? Why does he say that? This is the same Peter in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost who quoted the prophet Joel, right? This, what you hear, is prophesied by the prophet Joel. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit, says God. In the last days. And Peter remembers that. He knows that. These are the last days. Friends, it was true then. It is even truer for us now. These are the last days. This is the home stretch. And there must be some, some urgency to it. The end is near. Jesus has died. He has ascended. He now sits at the right hand of the throne of the Father. And the end is near. Even though for us it's 2,000 years plus, but this is the home stretch. There's nothing anymore for, but except for him to return. This is the home stretch. Therefore, two things. Be alert. Be sober. 
What's the opposite of that? Be clouded, be foggy, be distracted, right? Be clouded, be drowsy. And what will cause us to be in that kind of a condition, to be clouded, foggy, drowsy, if I believe Peter is referring to wild, reckless, self-willed living. That will cause us to be drowsy and foggy and clouded where God is concerned. But on the other hand, if we are focused on God, we will be clear, alert, and sober-minded. And if we are clear, we are focused on God, what should we do? We should pray. We should pray. Prayer is really not an option. You need to follow Peter's argument. Peter is saying the end is near. This is the final stretch already. Make sure you pray and with alert minds and clear minds. So he's urging us to pray urgently, fervently, not in a cold and casual kind of a manner. Karen Jobs, this biblical scholar, she said, the first resources for living out Christ's victory is the believer's prayer life. That is the first resource for living out Christ's victory is our prayer life, how we connect to God, how we commune with God. In light of these last days, you know, in, these are the last days, this is the final stretch. But in light of that, what should our prayer point be when we come to God, when we pray? What should our prayer point be when we ask to be urgent and fervent in prayer? But because of these last days, what should our prayer point be? What do you think? We should pray for God's agenda. What's really important on God's heart? We should pray for that. Not random kind of rambling, not vain repetition, but with clear minds, with thoughtful minds, pray God's agenda. We ask, or well, this one big thing that we can ask, we ask that God, for God through us to do for others what He has done for us. I think that's one big thing that we can ask that through us, that God will do for others what He has done for us. Dr. Gary Miller wrote a book about biblical theology on prayer, and D.A. Carson wrote uh, uh, some comments about this book. And he says what Dr. Gary Miller has uncovered is that the majority of biblical prayers are tied in one fashion or another to God's purposes. Biblical prayer, Dr. Gary Miller in his research has found that biblical prayers are tied in one fashion or another to God's purposes across the sweep of redemptive history. But he has also found that a great deal of contemporary Christian praying is centered on individual anxieties, needs and preferences and not on the purposes and promises of God. So, he's not saying that this is wrong, but he says that it's so imbalanced that all the time, or most of the time, our prayers are centered on our own needs, our own preferences, our own anxieties, rather than on the purposes and the promises of God. And it's so imbalanced. I think we need to right the balance. You know, in prayer, we are not praying to manipulate God for our own private ends. But it's really to pray. Like Jesus taught his disciples to pray. What did he say? What is the overall overarching theme of prayer? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And then everything flows from there. That is the main body. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And all the other tributaries will flow from there. That is how I think we should pray for God's agenda fervently and also urgently. I also pray for my grandchildren, two granddaughters. I pray for them, you know, even when they go on holiday, 
but they will enjoy themselves, see a lot of new things. But I pray that in all their fun, as they experience new things and God's wonder and also all the new technologies and so on, that all these will also point them to God. Finally, that is what is important, that they will experience God for themselves. We pray, of course, as parents, we pray that our children will have many A's, correct or not? Noah, to what end? We pray for them to have many A's. To what end? We pray for ourselves to be healthy and strong. To what end? We pray for the nation to be free of corruption and racism. To what end? We must answer these questions and that will motivate, energize our prayer. We must have the right focus, the right end in mind. So pray for God's agenda with urgency and fervency. The next passage. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. This fourth instruction has three sub-instructions, okay? So it's pretty packed but let's see what we can do with this today. The fourth instruction is to love constantly. Actually, I think, I believe it means, you know, we have heard the phrase, the only constant is change, or change is the only constant, right? This, it means, let love be your only constant. Let your constant be love. Love constantly. Love each other deeply. So the word describes, you know, that love, let your love be stretched. Let your love be extended. So God, or Peter, is asking us to love in such a way that our love keeps stretching in depth and also in endurance. Keep stretching your love, extending your love. So in every circumstance, let your love be extended. Not be fickle, not be fleeting. Let it be constant. Let your love be constant. How do you do that? One, forgive. Forgive. It says love covers over a multitude of sins. How do we understand it? How should we understand this? Actually, Peter is referring or quoting from Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12. And it gives the opposite or the antithesis of what it means by love covers over a multitude of sins. It says, hatred stirs up strife. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. So you want to know what this means? You can also see this. Love covers over a multitude of sins. The opposite of that is hatred. Hatred stirs up strife. So where there is no forgiveness, there is a tendency to uncover the opposite of cover up, uh, to cover over is to uncover. Uncover sins and offenses. Dig it up. Dig up all these grievances. Dig up all the offenses and make an issue out of it. All the faults, all the wrongs. Stir up strife. Stir up dissension. Stir up dissatisfaction. That is the opposite of how it is to love. Why is this important, especially among first century Christians? Because Peter was writing to first century Christians, right? The first century Christian, we must understand, was small, much, much smaller than this. And believers were in towns that are, you know, widely spread out across Asia Minor. Now, if the relationships in this small community was destroyed by hatred that stirs up strife, then the believers would have nowhere to run, nowhere to turn to. But more importantly, 
the witness of the gospel in that place will be extinguished. It will be snuffed out. That is why it was so important then. But does it mean that it's not important today? Of course not. It is as important today. We don't want that to happen to us. So, we really should ask ourselves some questions. Do we have a list of people who we find difficult to relate with? Do you have such a list? Do you have a name that you can put on that list? This is your list. Do you have a name there? These are the people I find difficult to relate to. Do you have such a list? Do you have a name? I wish mine was blank, but it's not. Is yours blank? Probably not, because we are all so different. But what do we do? We must not hate. We must not dig up things that have been dealt with before and then stir up strife. We must not spread the poison around because that would hurt the church, that would hurt the witness of the church, that would hurt relationships within the church. You know, a lot more can be said about forgiveness and, and this area. But this is one thing that I found helpful or insightful. I was speaking to one of the seminary lecturers and talking about Peter, you know. When he came to Jesus, he said, no, shall I forgive my brother? How many times shall I forgive my brother? And Jesus replied, remember, 70 times, seven times. And this lecturer said, you know, when Jesus answered Peter, was Jesus telling Peter to forgive 70 times seven different occasions or 70 times seven times for the same offense? I, I found that helpful because as we all know, forgiveness is not easy, isn't it? It may take time. You might need to forgive time and again and again and again and again even for the same offense. But as you do so, and we might come to that place where we, we need to forgive some offense time and time and time and time again because it keeps coming up. But as you do so, do not spread the poison around. Do not spread the hatred around. And that's easy to do, isn't it? By innuendo, by insinuations, we can hurt other people. But let's not do that. That's how love, that's how love can be constant. All right? But before I finish with this, I just want to say that cover over is not cover up. Okay? There is a difference between covering over and a cover up. That's another story for another time. But sins and offenses and wrongs, there's a place to confront that as well. It doesn't mean that we cover up everything. It doesn't mean that we sweep everything under the carpet. It doesn't mean that there are passages in the Bible that tells us how to deal with this. Okay, but we don't have time for that. But I thought it's just important to say that, you know, cover over, that love covers over a multitude of sins, a multitude of wrongs. It's not the same thing as a cover-up. Second thing under love constantly, be hospitable. Be hospitable with open hearts. That's in verse 9. You know, at that time, where did the local church meet? In a place like this? No. The local church would meet in people's homes, in people's houses. So Peter is encouraging them to open up their homes so that the believers there, the, sm the small number of believers there can go and worship and fellowship together. And you can imagine, we touched on this before, that these were in hostile territory, right? The people around them were hostile. They were suffering. And you can imagine that hey, these homeowners uh, may be reluctant, okay? I don't want to open up my home for this kind of meeting, for this kind of fellowship, for this kind of worship. Why? Because if they open up their homes in that area, they may be the target, new targets. People might focus on them. So they may be reluctant, hesitant to open up their homes. But Peter is saying, be hospitable. Open up your homes. Open up your hearts. And opening up their homes was also important because any believer who was in distress or who was in trouble could find 
a place of refuge. A warm place, a place of fellowship and support. It was important then. They never had their direct stalls, you know, and other places where they could go to and hang out and talk and things like that. In our setting, it may be different. Yes, we can go to their direct store, we can go to restaurants, we can go to places, but there is nothing that would duplicate a home environment. True or not? When you receive somebody into your home, it's like family. There's a warmth and a welcome that cannot be duplicated. And that's why it's so important. SOPs have changed. Maybe CGs are meeting in homes again. Hey, you know, thank, thank your hosts for opening their homes. I know some of them go to great trouble huh, to make sure everything is like showroom condition. But no need, lah, huh? We, 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 we treasure, we value the heart condition, the welcome, isn't it? The warmth, even greater. So, be hospitable. We open up not just the home. Opening up the home is symbolic uh, of opening up our hearts to people. So how do you love constantly? How do you have a love that is constant? Be hospitable. Open up your hearts. And one of the ways GBC has done it before, and I hope that it will return, is our Sunday lunch. Amen? <laughs> Be hospitable. This is where we welcome people. Third one, love constantly, serve others with God-graced gifts and God-given strength. Peter affirms that gifts are given through God's grace. Gifts are given by God's grace. And he says that, use these gifts. Use these gifts to what? To serve others as what? As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So we are faithful stewards. It's not for us to keep. Faithful stewards to be used to serve others for God's glory, right? That, that's what he says in 1 Peter. Okay, this is object lesson time. Can I ask Joel and Miraka? Is Miraka here? Can I ask Joel and Miracle to come very quickly? Yeah, thank God for these children. These two are good buddies. Yeah, just come. Come so that the camera can, can see you as well. Hi. This one is for you. And this one is for you. All right, you can go back now. These are gifts. And that is what it means when Peter says, you know, you have received gifts from God. What did these two children do to earn that? Nothing. In the same way, the terminology should tell us, should drive this home that whatever talents we have, whatever strengths we have, these are gifts of God. We didn't do anything to deserve them. It's just God just gave. Just God gives it these strengths, these talents to us by His grace. And therefore, it's meant to be used to serve others, to serve everyone for His glory. So we use this in the name of God, in the strength of God, for the glory of God. And we shouldn't say that, hey, you know, only the, the preacher, those with the word gifts uh, are important. AV, uh, yeah, who cannot do AV? Everybody can do AV, ma. Usher, who cannot usher? Everybody can smile, ma. No. But they do it in the strength of God. Yes or no? Yes. No, no sound from AV. They are focusing. <laughs> in the strength of God, for the glory of God. So whatever gifts we have, you know, when we use it, it's not about elitism, it's not about self-glory, it's for the glory of God and for everyone. And so this is one important thing, you know, now that again, you no know, SOPs have changed. You know, for those of us who, 
are still online and no, if, it's, if you are online just for the convenience of home, I really want to encourage us to really be here, not just for the worship experience, huh, but really here is the fellowship. We serve one another here. We love one another here in person. I think that's important in person. So community, again, all this uh, love constantly and all the three sub-points under love constantly is really for the preservation of the church, to strengthen the witness of the church. It's not just good rules for living. It's really about church and it's really about God. Community is preserved. The community of faith is preserved. And the community of faith thrives when all these are done in the name of Christ and in the spirit of Christ. Let's take a look at the GBC one. How about this? All this makes GBC a loving and a safe place. And I put certified there. You agree or not? <laughs> this, is, this, this place is supposed to be like that. When love is constant, when we serve one another, love one another, there, there'll be no hatred and there's, there's forgiveness. And we are hospitable, then this becomes a loving and a safe place for everyone. Remember, we are not here to glorify God's instruments. We are here to glorify God and to thank everyone who serves. You know, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. Again, this is also important. It says that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God, is the love of Christ. So it means that experiencing the staggering, overwhelming, limitless love of Christ is not done in blissful isolation. It is done with the community of God, with all God's people. That's why it's important to gather together, to relate with one another, love constantly, love constantly, forgive, be hospitable with open hearts, and serve, serve others with God's grace gifts and God-given strength. Now lastly, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome? For those who do not obey the gospel of God, and if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. This brings us to the end of chapter 4. Chapter 4 begins with suffering, ends with suffering. This is the book end of chapter 4, suffering. And everything that we've talked about just now is in the middle suffering number five peter tells us expect to suffer as a christian expect to suffer if christ suffered if the messiah the, the master suffered you can expect suffering as well expect to suffer i'm not sure you know sometimes the gospel is presented to people to say that you know life will be peachy life will be a beach Life will be rosa, you know, a bed of roses after you become a Christian. Not true. It's not true. There can be suffering. You can expect suffering as a Christian. Why? Because the world, because of the hostile world, because of sinful world, if for no other reason. If you are insulted, the passage says, 
Because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. It doesn't mean that after you have suffered, then the spirit of God rests on you, and then therefore you are blessed. It doesn't mean that. It means that when you suffer, it is a mark. If you suffer as a Christian, it is an evidence, a mark, that the Spirit of God rests on you. And whoever the Spirit of God rests on is blessed. That's what it means. So, if you suffer for the name of Christ, rejoice. Be glad. Praise God. And it says, do not be ashamed. You are blessed for the Spirit of God rests on you. That is your mark. So do you have scars, scars of suffering? That is a mark that the Spirit of God rests on you. And the one on whom the Spirit of God rests on can be really certain of, again, this big word, eschatological hope, the hope of the resurrection the hope of glorification, the hope of the living in God's presence forever and ever and joy forever, everlasting joy. So rejoice, praise God when you suffer as a Christian, when you're mocked, when you're reviled, when you're ridiculed as a Christian, when people taunt you as a Christian, rejoice. Do not be ashamed. But more than that, commit yourselves to God and continue to do good. Commit it's a name, it's a phrase that we use for banking. It's like a deposit to a bank. Commit yourself to God. Why? Because it is secure. God will guard it like the bank will guard your money. You're afraid that if you put your money in the bank, the bank will take it and use it and you'll be lost or not. Are you afraid? No. Huh? Wow. <laughs> Maybe you are. <laughs> but that's not God. Same phrase. Commit, commit. You will be safe with God. God will protect, God will guard it. Nothing can snatch it away. It will not be lost. Commit yourselves to God. Continue to do good. So we can have full confidence in, our, in God even in our suffering. Nothing will snatch us away. God is there to welcome us. Christ reigns supremely and He will be there for us now and also in time to come. Continue to do, to do good. Persevere. Don't give up even in suffering. So, all five. I'm not, I'm not sure how many we remember. I hope some of these will really speak to us today. Because of the truth of what Christ has done, because of everything that He has done, because of who He is today, let us live like this. Arm yourselves with the same attitude as Christ. Be willing to suffer. Focus on God's will and judgment, not on the world's. Pray for God's agenda with urgency and fervency. Love constantly. Let your love be your constant. And expect to suffer as a Christian. You know, 1 Peter 4 is not intended to beat us up. Uh. Hey, you're not living like this, you know. Shame on you. It's not like that. First Peter 4, like one preacher says, invites us, invites us to live the kingdom life, the life that Christ would have us live as his people. It is a, an invitation for us. You are God's people. You believe in Christ. Come, live this way. Live this way. This is what God intends for us. This is an invitation to us. How many of you will accept this invitation to live kingdom life this way? Do you? And I know we will sing a response song in, in a bit. And I'm not sure. Today, I want to open this time too for you to respond to God. I think this is an important passage and maybe there are points that you want to respond to. Some of us might want help to live this way because it's, it's not easy and we need every bit of help that the Spirit of God will, help, will, will give to us. 
and you might want help that way or someone to pray alongside you. You may be weighed down by sin or by sorrow and you want somebody to pray with you. You may, want, you, you may have been hurt actually, harmed, whether in the church or outside of the church by the words that people say, by the things that they do and you need some kind of healing somebody can pray together with you for that for some of you you might have come to realize today that hey christian life is not a beach you can expect to suffer as a christian you might want to speak to somebody about that and pray about it as well so as we sing if any of this if you would like prayer for any of these things or for any other reason i want to welcome you to the front where ministers and servants and fellow brothers and sisters will pray alongside you. All right? Yeah, let's stand. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but true Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the continue to sing just for a short while again the invitation is open for us to respond today to God not to me so if you are in a place where this has really spoken to you we really want to invite you to come and make that take a step of faith and come before God it's between you and God just a practical step amen No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And He was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold. My sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my belief All the changes are released I can sing, I am free And not I, but through Christ in me I long to follow Jesus, for He has said, 
that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand. Not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in each one of us. Lord, our heart, our flesh may fail, but Lord, you are the strength of our hearts. Our strength may falter, but Lord, we rely on you and your spirit, O God. Thank you that your spirit rests on each one of us. Father, I'm not sure how much we will remember, but I pray, Lord, that you will call this to our remembrance, that we might live in ways that will be pleasing to you, and Lord, that you will be delighted in us, and Lord, that you will be proud of us all, individually, as a family, and as a church, O oh God. To you, we commit ourselves, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you.